Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, see, Alan has done a runner straight away. This is, this is supposed to happen. Oh, there's somebody important. There's a VIP at the door. Or something like that. Gosh, it's quiet. I see them up and down the car park. So. Yeah, they've arrived. Somebody. So now, sooner or later, we'll be on the road. If I may, just at the beginning, my dear people, uh, point out those who are coming up and using uh, speaking here or singing, uh, they may use this microphone. Uh, it would be always turned on. Uh, it may be that you need to kind of uh, just change the direction slightly to uh, maximize the because of a person's height. Uh, and uh, the same would apply to the, the microphone on the lectionary there on the reading desk. So uh, either way, it's, uh, they're adaptable and they're quite flexible in that regard. Peace be with you, Alan. <laughs> All right, okay. Very good. Very good. Now you can breathe easy. Okay? Okay. Welcome, my dear people, to uh, our opportunity to gather together and to say farewell to somebody who was much loved and greatly cherished in this area. This might be described as a home fixture because the Randalls were here for a long time. So thank you to Alan and Anne and James and Katrina for all that they've done for this community and for the neighborhood and their involvement in schooling and in all sorts of different ways, which you will hear about later. One of her great, great gifts was to gather people around her, to, get, to bring people together and to bring people together with the purpose of sharing and enjoying time and life. That's a great gift in itself. Most of us kind of see somebody coming and we duck over to the other side of the road or something like that. So it's a great, great gift to want to and greet people warmly and make them feel they are welcome in every way. Also, uh, it is a great gift to realize that we are called by the Lord himself to uh, have life and to share it to the full. The fullness of life, according to Jesus Christ in the Gospel, is, uh, I was going to say very simple, but it is that we actually maximize what we have, the gifts we have, maximize the gifts we have, and the fullness of life is only realized, uh, unfortunately, very unfortunately, but really I do mean this, I believe this very firmly, the fullness of life was only realized for all of us uh, when we're called home to our heaven, to the heavenly kingdom. So that Katrina may be 
sharing in the fullness of life now and uh, maximize and realize all the gifts she had. Uh, so we, most people underplay their hand and don't realize the range of territory that they can cover and the gifts that they, they bring to others, people, because you don't know how you affect the, the, the heart of another person. So welcome again uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you today, and may all of the, the program that follows be a commentary on her. And we let us be glad to share it with each other, because that's what stamped her uh, kind of a pattern of life most of all. So I will be back for the blessing, and now let us proceed. Okay, thank you.
Hi. Um, hello. Uh, to those of you who don't know me, um, I'm, I'm Kat's brother, but I see a lot of familiar faces here. It's good to see you all. Um, I'd probably like to start out um, by saying, okay, if, if any of the immediate family don't look too cut up, don't look like we're, we're too broken up about this, we managed to get a lot of the, the original mourning out of the way at, a, um, at the initial funeral in Scotland. And I'd like to take this moment to say to anyone who couldn't make it, shame on you. Um, I mean, it was only 450 miles into the middle of rural Scotland in late March at two weeks' notice. Please try and make a little effort. Um, I'll be honest, I was, I was, I was, I was an absolute mess. Um, I tried to say a few words, and I, I broke down, and I managed to just about get out a joke that I never got a chance to tell Kat, um, which was... The past, the present, and the future all walk into a bar. It was a very tense situation. I thought Kat would have lost, lost, lost her nut over that. No, that's just, that's just me. Um, I've got, an got another joke for you. Um, what does a nihilist say at his sister's funeral? Well, let's see. <laughs> Katrina Randall is dead. It's been a few months now, and I still don't feel quite right about it. I don't think I'm supposed to, though. It's a tragedy. Um, makes you 37. Right. It's always hard to know what to do with a tragedy. Um, I've had a little time to think about it. You can learn from it. It's such an overwhelming feeling of loss. It's, it's like a great song, but like cut short. You know, it's left with nothing happening. And it's denied the chance to bring back that riff for that half tempo breakdown. It really happened. You know. right. More than that in this case, man, because from what I knew of Kat, there is a book that we never got to read and a symphony that we never got to hear that she could have and should have written. Right. So let me tell you a little bit about Cat Man. She's a woman that's been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. She was, amongst other things, truly quite brilliant, right? an incredible mind. Like she excelled academically, more so she was really gifted musically, where it kind of really matters. Like she, I watched her sort of breeze through school, and she could play loads of instruments and speak a couple of languages by the time she was about 15. And watching all this from a few years behind, um, it can be quite intimidating. Um, no, 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 no. So suffice to say, I just learned. I just learned to. I just learned to be. I learned to, to do the things that she couldn't, and it worked. We made a good team. Right. A real game proved to be language, sort of words. And she went on to study that in South Africa. But I could give you the story of her life as I as I knew it, um, but I think a lot of people here are actually there for a lot of that. They don't need to hear it. In fact, you've probably got some stories that you want to tell me, and I would absolutely love to hear right. um, So, yeah, I'll tell you one story. One story about me and Kat, I think. My fa let's call it my fa This thing on. There we go. Um, I think I was about 22, and me and Kat were in South Africa for Christmas, and Mum and Dad were, were in England. Um, so we had just Christmas on our own um, in South Africa. We got, we got um, and hid all our presents around the house. Then woke up the next morning and had to find them again. It was great. We then spent the day eating duck and drinking whiskey. Merry Christmas to all. Uh, um, so yeah, the um, thing is when you grow up with someone, you end up knowing them very well. Um, I'll probably take a chance to let you in on a little secret about Kat. I, she, was, she, was really good at, she was really good at putting on a mask. She was incredible at maintaining kind of composure. She, she always wanted people to think she was the most collected together person. And she did. She was, she was good at what she did. I, I'll tell you, the, the sad truth is behind that mask, Kat was never actually a particularly well woman. Right? She'd had problems with her kidneys when she was a kid. 
like, you know, they got through them, but they're always kind of there. Um, she eventually got diagnosed with a condition called ataxia. Um, it's probably been present to, agree, to some degree her entire life. Um, so if those of you who are close to her, like those, those you know, maybe those little clumsy moments, you know, maybe the occasional trip, the occasional fall, it wasn't just Cat being a bit silly. It was, it was a serious medical condition that we, we didn't catch till pretty late on. Um, I won't bore you with the details about it, but when it's finally been diagnosed, she actually eventually managed to beat it. Um, she came through it all, like she was walking on a stick, she made it back to work, she, she, was, she was doing well. Problem is, going through something like that leaves a human being very vulnerable. Um, yeah, and cancer can take a completely strong person and just annihilate them. So, yeah, uh, like, final struggle, but ultimately quite brief. I think from diagnosis to the end, it was about five, six months. And just to really twist the knife, uh, we got the all clear at Christmas. Surgery and chemo had worked. Um, she was back home. I went up to see her. It was going to be fine. It's going to be great. And yeah, two months later, totally different story. Yeah. I mean, what can we say about this incredible, brilliant woman? Uh, she, was a, she was a phenomenal song, cruelly cut short. She will be remembered as an unfinished novel left to become a cult classic. I mean, in the words of my favorite author, some kind of strange prototype never really meant for mass production. Uh, should have seen her when she cut loose, man. It was unreal. <laughs> so now here, here we are. We're in the aftermath. Now. And it's actually us that are left to pick up the pieces. I mean, that's the cold, cruel reality of death. Don't pity the dead. And pity the living, for it is we who remain. Right. It comes to us all. It's the only guarantee in life. And we're always so surprised when it happens. I said Kat was brilliant, and I meant it. You could, you could see her mind working. You could see these little cogs and gears, just like kind of whirring away, processing everything, taking in this just stream of information and working out how she could use it. She was incredible. And because of this mask, a lot of people never really knew that. Like, the truth is, man, like, modern world didn't actually deserve a mind like that. Like, not really. Like, I think on some terrifying subconscious level, she knew that. So she learned to kind of smile, maybe, a, maybe a look a bit silly, appreciate it all with her feet up, glass of cold white wine. Maybe we should, oh, sorry, should I? No, I'm all right, I'm gonna finish the speech. It's like, any complaints, take it up with the big man. So this incredible mind, man, it learned to play dumb and take the easy way out. It was the same with the music, man. Like, she could do it all. It was no challenge. Like, she could, she could just pick up instruments and play them. I think it was no challenge. No sense of satisfaction. No Maybe that's the lesson we should take away here. This life is not easy. Sometimes it's a real struggle. It's how we deal with that struggle. It's how we overcome it. Like, that's what makes life real. So everyone here is going to go and have a little think about their lives now. About the things they've always wanted to do. About the things the world told them they couldn't be real. And I want every one of you to go out and make them real. Right. Maybe it'll take you a day. And maybe it'll take you a month. Maybe it'll take you ten years. But you're going to do it. You're going to do it for Kat. You're going to do it for me. And really, you're going to do it for you. Right. You only get one chance in this life. And then it's done. What does a nihilist say at his sister's funeral? Well, go read some Sartre, man. Go to Paris. Right? They'll explain to you the meaning of life might be a packet of smokes, bottle of vodka, grand piano, and the void. And, and if that was the case, Kat had this down by the time she was about 22, and there was nothing more we could teach her. Katrina Ingrid Randall. She burned bright and brief. We're all poorer for a loss. I would now like to introduce um, a very close friend of Cat's, Laura Starkey. She's going to sing her favourite song, Your Song, by Elton John. Um, and then her favourite poem by her cousin Sam, um, which is Sunlight in the Garden. Thank you very much.
Man, it's inconvenient how tall you are. Could he not have been a bit shorter? Uh, this is a poem by the Irish poet, Louis McNeese, um, who actually, um, actually read this poem at Katrina's last service, but we thought, oh, we'll give it another go. You know, sequels are great. Um, the Sunlight on the Garden. The sunlight on the garden hardens and grows cold. We cannot cage the minute within its nets of gold. When all is told, we cannot beg for pardon. Our freedom as free lances advances towards its end. The earth compels upon it sonnets and birds descend. And soon, my friend, we shall have no time for dances. The sky was good for flying, defying the church bells and every evil iron, siren and what it tells. The earth compels, we are dying, Egypt dying. I'm not expecting pardon, hardened in heart anew, but glad to have sat under thunder and rain with you, and grateful too for sunlight on the garden. Cheers. Hello, everyone, can you hear me? <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Fee, and I've known Kat probably just over 20 years now. Um, we met at Farnborough Hill School. Um, so during our time at school, we quickly became friends. I think we actually met in the kind of later years, but quickly became firm friends. Kat spent her time at school engaging, of course, in her academic studies, participating in many extracurricular activities as well, such as the chamber choir, orchestra, and, of course, the ongoing job of planning the things that we do outside of school. The social calendar was, of course, always full and needed constant attention. I have many happy memories of time spent at Crabtree Road with Katrina and other friends, many of whom are here today and will no doubt also fondly remember these occasions. From summer parties in the garden to quiet gatherings for birthdays, Christmas evenings at the pub or Randall residence attended by the then local contingent were also a favourite. We had a fair few gatherings at my parents' place as well, back in the, uh, back in the day, probably not to their knowledge, <laughs> staying up in the early hours and making the most of the summers when Kat had made her highly anticipated returns from South Africa. I think it would disappoint Katrina, and I know Anne finds it funny as well, to not acknowledge that the last time I was here was for the joint 18th 21st birthday party for Katrina and James, where I may have fallen down with some excitement of the evening into a ditch in the car park and had to be taken home. <laughs> Another slightly more respectable memory on my part was the brilliant party Kat had for her 30th in Elstead. I actually remember saying excitedly to Will, it's going to be the party of the year, and it was. Really happy memories from them. Kat had excellent cooking skills, again, something many of you will too have experienced. The range of her culinary delights was impressive, from topical birthday cakes to roast dinners, perfectly barbecued fish, and then there was also the guacamole, but apparently, according to my mum, has never been trumped. Kat made this for us when she stayed with us a couple of times back in the school and college days. I fondly remember Wine Thursdays at my flat when I lived in Camberley. This is a firm fixture in the diary, forsaking all other plans and a chance for us to debrief our respective weeks and compare notes on work-related dilemmas and generally put the world to rights. There are many fun memories and adventures to look back on, such as our trip to Prague, evenings out during Reading, during the Yale days, as Kat referred to them by, my hen do, when Katrina may or may not have flooded the bathroom, <laughs> Funny memory in hindsight, which we probably teased her about too much at the time, but she took very graciously, as was her style. We bonded over music and our love of a few classic songs, the duet renditions, Katrina on the piano, of course, which left me on vocals, were no doubt just as much a treat to hear as they were to perform. Favourites included Elton John's Your Song, as beautifully played by Laura, um, and Promise Me by Beverly Craven. I can't not mention games such as Articulate and Scrabble when I remember Kat. Such was her love and superior knowledge of the English language that this theme spilled over into the fun remit in the form of these games. 
I hold Kat responsible for the fact that none of my family will play articulate with me anymore as I take it too seriously. But it was better when I teamed up with Kat anyway. We were normally a winning combination. Anyway, these are some reflections and recollections of times that we had together, but when I remember Kat, it's mainly a feeling of and reflection of us just being together somewhere and laughing a lot and talking a lot and having a mutual understanding of each other. All this was complemented with her quick and sharp wit and brilliant storytelling, which, again, I'm sure many of you can relate to. Kat was always really happy to help people with things that she knew a lot about. As highlighted by James, this was a lot of things, covered a big remit, and she always had as much time for people and more as they needed. She was there to listen and provide helpful support during any difficult times, with a dose of humour and perspective thrown in too. She was fun-loving and caring and truly one of a kind. I think that phrase gets used very often, but it couldn't be more fitting for anyone than it is for Katrina. Hi, I'm James. Can you hear me, first of all? Good start. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about Kat, and I'm actually going to use some of her own words, which is why I've got my phone in my hand. Um, so the first thing uh, I'm going to read is a message from the 8th of January, 2022. So in this, Kat says, learning British sign language, buying all of Amazon, killing pot plants, you know the usual. I have discovered the delights of self-adhesive manicures and started a Terry Pratchett Discworld collection chronologically. It's like my own personal lockdown without the novelty value of a pandemic, BBZ, which some of you will know means babes, which Kat used to use in almost every text, ironically, because she hated people using it. <laughs> I thought I'd look into Terry Pratchett Discworld because I haven't read it, and I found something in there which was... I think appropriate for today. No one is finally dead until the ripples they cause in the world die away. The span of someone's life, they say, is only the core of their actual existence. So I'm going to talk about a few of those ripples that, uh, that I think are still there. They're more like a waterfall. I don't know if that's the right analogy, maybe the wake of a, of a big ship. Um, but I only have a maximum of five minutes, so I'm going to try and be careful. I first met Kat in, I think, 2006, so 16 years ago. I'd heard about her before I met her from people like Fee, um, and there was a bit of a big build-up before I met her, and I hoped that there was a good reason for this. Um, finally, Kat came back from South Africa, and uh, we met um, in a pub in Cambly, I think. And from there, very quickly, um, I became a regular at Crabtree Road, uh, which Fee, Fee talks about. At the time, um, Alan and Anne were away in South Africa, so there was an empty house. Um, I'm not going to reveal all of those details. They're going to stay uh, beyond the grave, I think. Um, but I think these were the only parties where five-course dinners were served to, to the guests. Um, things like monkfish kebabs and beef wellington were on the menu. When Alan and Anne came back from South Africa, I thought that was it, the end of this uh, stage of parties and uh, all these gatherings, and um, that we'd be back to the Cambly Weatherspoons. But actually, things carried on pretty much as usual, except Kat had kindly offered Alan and Anne as a taxi service that provided a free shuttle to the pubs of Cambly after dinner. And I think in those days, Anne put her background in social services to good use when talking to people who were half or fully uh, drunk at the time, most of, most of Kat's friends. And I think, Alan, you wisely hid away in the background. I don't remember seeing you during those conversations. And I think in those pubs, we used to do cryptic crosswords. And in the venues we went to, I don't think those pages of a newspaper were ever read, but we sat there doing our cryptic crosswords. If I got an answer before Kat, Kat was both appalled and proud because she'd obviously claimed that she had taught me everything or she'd say that the clue was worded wrongly. I used to go round with new songs that I'd heard with piano in 
and Kat would sit and play them for me, getting angry if she hadn't learnt the song within five minutes. And what the main song I remember is what Laura beautifully played just then, uh, your song, Elton John. She used to endlessly tell me to get rid of my beard and tattoos. Neither of those happened. Um, and used to talk about my lack of hair, but saying, don't worry, I'm sure some will fancy you sometime if you convince them. <laughs> but all of this was actually a sign of Kat's warmth. She never actually had a real bad word to say about anyone, despite all of these, these jokes. She would always, whenever we used to criticise people, she'd always defend them and say that actually they're okay, really. I'm going to fast forward to, to this year again. Uh, so in March, Fee and I went up with Annabelle, who's also here today, um, to see Kat. What we didn't know with this trip is that we'd actually be saying good, goodbye to Kat. Um, we didn't need convincing to go, but I'm going to again read a message that was sent to uh, just to persuade me if I had any doubts. So the message uh, from March this time reads, You have to come as I'm at the funeral planning stage, babes, and I can't have my brother singing Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead. <laughs> I think, I don't want to speak too soon, but I think we've managed to stop that from happening. We also managed to stop Kat, and I don't know if this has happened yet either, she wanted to have Walking on Sunshine as one of the songs played. And we pointed out that that was more appropriate for a hen doing Cambly rather than a funeral. So hopefully that one's off the, off the list too. Fee, Kat, Annabelle and I stayed in the hotel where she had worked, in next door rooms, and we caught up like old times. Kat was constantly late and had again organised lots of lifts, uh, with Anne being the driver again. We were forced to play Scrabble until the early hours, and Kat won. On the last night, we went for dinner with Anne and Alan, uh, just like the old days, catching up, telling stories. Kat had baked some cookies. Uh, and it felt very much like the start of, of when we met, just being played over 16 years later. And uh, we walked out into a starry, moonlit night, and uh, we, we both said goodbye to Kat. We told her we loved her, and I think, I think we both knew that this could be our last goodbye. And uh, so we, we treated it like that. We had a long hug, and, uh, and we said goodbye. Um, and that's, those, those are my memories. Um, and I think now um, Beth and Davis is going to play a, a song, Both Sides Now, by Joni Mitchell. Before Kat died, she asked uh, that Beth and sang something, and so this is going to be it. Thanks. <laughs> and flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air and feathered canyons everywhere I've looked at clouds that way but now they only block the sun they rain and snow on everyone So many things I could have done But clouds got in my way I've looked at clouds from both sides now From up and down and still somehow it's cloud illusions I recall I really don't know clouds At all Moons and tunes and ferris wheels The dizzy dancing way you Every fairy tale comes real. I 
I've looked at love that way And how it's just another show You leave them laughing when you go And if you care, don't let them know Don't give yourself away I've looked at love from both sides now From give and take and still somehow It's love's illusions I recall I really don't know love At all Tease and fees and feeling proud To say I love you right out loud Dreams and schemes and circus crowds I've looked at life that way And how old friends are acting strange they shake their heads, they say I've changed Well, something's lost and something's gained In living every day I've looked at life from both sides now From win and lose and still somehow it's life's illusions I recall I really don't know life I've looked at life from both sides now From up and down and still somehow It's life's illusions I recall Oh, can you all hear me okay? Thanks, gals. You really know how to make an old man feel inadequate. How do you follow that, eh? I said to them before the service, look, just dial it back a bit. You know, I've got to come on straight after you. Don't make me look too stupid. That was one of the nicest versions of Both Sides Now I've heard probably in about 30, 40, 50 years. I still have a copy of Clouds. Um, it's one of my favourite songs. The arrangement uh, and the version that, that, that was performed in Love Actually uh, was an absolutely gorgeous one. And I, I remember when Anne said to me, Beth and singing it, I said, that's going to be special. It really is. And you didn't disappoint. So, um, the trouble is we're trying to come along and give a eulogy or a speech at this part of the service when everybody else has come and given their stories is that you, you tend to sit and think I was going to say that I was going to tell that story and it's not exactly as if it hasn't happened before it happened the first time around I mean this is an improvement actually in the, the first service the first funeral um, I was kind of like the warm-up act really in the bar afterwards um, everybody else got to sort of speak in the actual service and uh, I was in the bar, you know, so it's an improvement. I've actually made it to the actual service this time. But it's, what do you say about Katrina? Um, I think the best way of thinking about it is that I was thinking, what can I say about Katrina? You know, obviously 37 years and obviously I've known Katrina for all of those 37 years. And I thought there are certain key things that are important to Katrina. And language is one of them. And I thought, okay, how do we kick off on this? And there are certain phrases in the English language that have passed into folklore. In some cases, legend. 
Things like, we will fight them on the beaches, abandon ship. Or more recently, is this really Barnard Castle, officer? I must have taken the wrong turning on the North Circular. But I can guarantee you, none of them strike the same degree of terror into a man's heart as the phrase, uh, Uncle Stephen, I've been thinking, I've got an idea. Seriously. That gets you going, because our cat was always full of bright ideas. Some of them far-fetched, some of them ludicrous, but every now and then, some of them would work. Now, okay, I've been rattling on for a couple of minutes. For some of you who don't know me, I'm Cat's Uncle Steve. I'm the, the black sheep of the family. The veritable uncool uncle, as I used to say to some of you whenever there would be functions, I would sit in the corner. I'm the sort of person that they would trot out at family occasions to crack the odd gag and generally sort of liven things up. And Katrina said, apparently asked if I would give a sort of eulogy at the service, which of course I was happy to oblige. I was thinking, hey, this is my Andy Warhol moment, my five minutes of fame. So I asked the obvious questions. What can I talk about, Katrina? I said, well, OK, what about the incident in the bathroom when she locked herself in the bathroom? She was there all day. No, you can't talk about that. OK, fine. What about the incident when she broke the loose seat and caused carnage all over? No, you can't talk about that either. Great, you know? So basically, if you want to find out about those stories, I, I will be in the hall afterwards over a cup of tea. Um, buy me a beer and I will sing like a veritable canary. Because believe me, I know where all the skeletons are buried. But anyway, so if you think about Katrina and you think about the Randall household, you've got to think about the, in the various environments they're in and the things that are important to them. And probably one of the things that was most important to Katrina was food and catering and cooking. And you'd have to see Katrina in the environment with the rest of the family. And if you ever were lucky to be in Crabtree Road, and you would see the Randall family in their finest, in the kitchen. You know, it was a wonderful experience. And people like Gerald Durrell, James Herriot, David Attenborough could write volumes about the way the Randall family used to, cre used to create the kitchen. You'd get this whole, you'd get Alan there being very much the alpha male, and you'd say to Alan, how are things? Have mm. you ever noticed, whenever you ask Alan a question, mm. the arms go up like that. So Alan would be standing there issuing edicts all over the place, and then Anne would be scurrying around like a meerkat on steroids, all over the place. And then in the corner, you would see Katrina with her head in about two or three cookbooks, just issuing instructions, calling the shots. And when, in fact, they moved to Pit Lochry, it was even worse, because Katrina would come to the kitchen, because obviously mobility was a bit limited, so she'd assume a position in the throne at the end of the table, and she'd be issuing instructions about all these things, and it was just an amazing experience. It really was. Of course, every now and then it would go wrong, and you'd get the odd sort of implosion, and there'd be a bit of frustration, and Katrina would give off, and Anne would get a bit upset, and the foot would lash out, catch on the back of their calves, and Katrina would scream, ow, that hurt, you know, I should complain about child abuse to social services, and Anne would go, I am social services, knock yourselves out. I mean, <laughs> it really was. The best one was, when we came to, when we first moved up to, well, one of the, they moved up to Pilocker, and we, we were first went up there for Christmas for New Year, and Anybody would know our, our Northern Ireland lot. Sam, bless him, great guy, he's my son. Yeah, of course he's terrific. Bit limited on the old eating front. He's a, as we say in Northern Ireland, he's a steak man. You know, he, he likes it pure and simple. So very much it was a question of food with Katrina was, I mean, I swear blind probably the Allies invaded Northern France in 1944 with a lot less planning than Katrina would put in to thinking about what she's going to eat at Christmas Day. Seriously. So we had this one conversation, and I rang Anne up, and I said, OK, uh, what are we having at Christmas? Because I just need a warm Sam up, you know. She said, well, Katrina suggested we have goose, truffles, and quail's eggs. I'm thinking, right, OK, tell Sam it's chicken. It's a big one. Oh, and then at New Year, we're thinking of having gently seared venison with an accompanying single malt whiskey jus. Thinking, OK, tell Sam it's steak. 
hopefully the blood will have stopped by the time that the plates got to the table and it'll have stopped moving, if we're lucky, you know? In fact, I'm told Heston Blumenthal had Katrina on speed dial. So that was the thing about, as I said, you'd have these implosions, you'd have everything, and then Katrina would be talking to you about things, and then she'd be chatting gaily, and she'd hurtle off, and she'd actually run into the stairs instead of running up the stairs, because that was Katrina. But then I suppose, as James alluded, obviously that was a precursor of something that, was a, that we were going to become aware of later on in life, but we didn't know at the time. So when... We all heard the news, the tragic news, uh, that awful weekend in, 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 in March. And the day afterwards, I was in London with Sam at, at a Genesis gig at the O2. And we thought, OK, you know, we're circling the wagons here. What do we do? And so we were chatting. And I said, right, OK, how's James? You know, what's happening down there? So I rang him up on Saturday. I said, how you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm all right. OK, you're around tomorrow. Great. We're, gonna, we're coming down. So Sam and I came down. I thought, well, two, two lads around a table... They've got to talk, so basically alcohol and lots of food. You know, get it out of your system, work your way through it. But we laughed. We, we spent an awful lot of that, did we not, James? It was a hoot, you know, it was a bit of a mini pub crawl, but we laughed. And we laughed because we all wanted to look back on Katrina and life with Katrina as a positive thing and, me and remember the positive memories. And it was one of those things that we sat there, and I think it was Sam turned around and said, uh, Dad, she said, given where Katrina hopefully is now, as somebody told St. Peter that basically he'd better have to install some unbreakable bathroom doors. Because this is Katrina we're talking about. And the only thing I can say with people when you talk about things is be careful what you wish for. So the editor of the Heavenly Gazette Evening News and Gabriel's Trumpet or whatever they call the newspaper up there are better be on top form because the arm of the Lord may be long and the wrath mighty full. But if you wanted to see real venom, try sending a postcard to Katrina when you get your apostrophes in the wrong place. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, we're talking. I mean, it really is. I mean, James alluded to the fact that Katrina many was kind of a frustrated genius. I mean, she would learn these things just for the sheer hell of it. And then she realised, oh, I'm wake up one morning, I'm going to learn the bass clarinet. And off she'd go and do it. Oh, I'm going to do this. And then realise that you can't actually play the piano and the bass clarinet at the same time, therefore one's got to give. And that's, but she always gave it a, a, a try, you know. I mean, when you think about it, who else's first reaction on being limited these past few months by speech difficulties would be to start to master British Sign Language? And I guess if Rose Ellis could win strictly, then our cat could master and win something with BSL. Except that she didn't, as along came another battle that sadly she didn't win. But she gave it a damn good try. Board games, I, I, it's pointless talking about because others have expressed it more eloquently than I ever could. Um, she was vicious at board games. She took it very seriously. Um, I said to one person, it's a good job there never was an Olympic Games of board games, really, because she'd clean up. It really was. I mean, can you imagine, right? The mixed pairs Scrabbles final. <laughs> Katrina on one side of the table, Vladimir Putin on the other side. And she just looks at him and says, listen, I can live with the invasion of Ukraine. Energy prices, I can live with those too. But you leave me having to win this game with a seven-letter word, last two double X's, Vlad, me old mucker, you are toast. And that was Katrina, a whole outlook, you know. Katrina, I suppose when we think about words, the current very popular um, game at the moment is Wordle. So... While I, I wrap things up, I'm going to say the key word that I want to talk about today is, today's Wordle word is five letters. I'm going to give you a clue. It starts with a B and it ends with a letter E. Now, I'm not going to wait for everybody to go through it because uh, my wife is sitting there going, all right, okay, how long you got? Right, fine. Because guaranteed two and a half minutes she'll have it sussed. But the word is brave. And Katrina taught us how to be brave. She taught us how to be brave in the most challenging of circumstances and how to be brave right up until the very end and how to never give up. Katrina, you were taken from us far too soon. 
But as someone once said of another life tragically taken before its time, you accomplished more in your 37 years than most people accomplish in a lifetime three times the length. And you may no longer be with us in the physical sense, but you left us with something more valuable in the long term. And that is a vastly growing collection of stories and memories. And whilst the body grows old and weary, memories never fade. They will last forever. So lastly, we've obviously all been through a traumatic time and we really have, and I can't imagine how other members of the family have gone through. It's been tough, you know. When children are born, certain friends, relatives, uncles and aunts, even the uncool ones, every now and then are asked to be godparents, if you're lucky. And your task is basically to keep that child, keep them on the right, look after them, things like that, and keep them on the safe, straight and narrow. And, and when we get involved, we have feelings. So, so lastly, how do I feel about this personally? It's hit me hard. It really has. I know my suffering pales into insignificance compared to other members, and certainly of the more closer members of the family, but there was no rhyme, reason, or rhythm to any of this. None of it made any sense. And for those of us who know the Northern Ireland office, which is what we describe our part of the family, we tend to describe ourselves... We've been hit with three family bereavements this year. It's not been a good year. And as I jokingly said in, in a sort of gallows humour way at one funeral, it's a bit like waiting for a London bus, you know? Nothing happens for a long time, and then along come three at once. But this one hit me really hard, because with Katrina, she could be bossy. She could be annoying. She could be frustratingly pompous at times. But then overall, you just wanted to give her a big hug. And I've said there was no reason in any of this, so I've struggled with this almost to the point of stretching any personal faith I had to almost breaking point. And I've thought about this an awful lot over these past few months, and all I can say is that as far as this godfather is concerned, he is definitely not amused by the way things have turned out. I am not a happy man in all of this. I really am not. And as I said, to lapse into mafia parlance Someone somewhere better have a damn good explanation in all of this, because if I get to the pearly gates, huh, unlikely I know, I get there, somebody better give a damn good reason why this happened, because I'm not a happy man. And all I can say is, Katrina, you will never, ever be forgotten. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Neil. Uh, Katrina would know me as Uncle Neil. I've been following Stephen Morgan for 43 years. And it's no different today. And by the way, Steve, I was going to say that. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming to this wonderful celebration. And... Uh, it's wonderful to see so many faces um, here and to hear such wonderful stories and such wonderful music. Thank you all. When Alan and Anne asked me to say a few words, um, initially I thought, well, what story haven't you heard? And it occurred to me that I could tell you about the time that I threw Katrina into a swimming pool somewhere in the Black Forest in Germany. Um, the purpose, of course, was to teach her to swim. And just really as I had been thrown into the Adriatic Sea, Michael, Christine, Minette, by my Aunt Mirez many years before. Yes, Aunt Mirez had a dark side when it came to swimming lessons. However, Aunt Mirez made sure that I had a life jacket on at the time, whereas I did not. Poor Katrina thankfully floated and uh, didn't swallow too much of the swimming pool, but I suspect she never forgot the experience and always harboured something of a grudge. She waited patiently for the right occasion to exact her revenge. That occasion was of my own making and it seemed like a pretty good idea at the time. As a way to fill up some time in retirement, I decided I was going to write a book. A novel. Should be fun. Only problem was, I had no idea how to do it. 
I had no subject, no ideas about writing style, and very limited English vocabulary compared to Katrina. I needed help. So I decided to engage Kat as my editor. She was good at words and might enjoy earning some pocket money. I should have known better. I should have remembered that Katrina could use even two words in a variety of ways. Never mind 75,000 in a book. As Stephen eloquently said, the words Uncle Neil come to mind. Always the formality. It could be an innocent greeting, Uncle Neil. It could be a question, Uncle Neil. It could be an expression of blame, Uncle Neil. It could even be a warning or a menacing threat, Uncle Neil. What chance did I have? Even if I could get past her amazing command of language and variations of tone, there was sentence construction and punctuation. Who amongst us hasn't experienced Katrina in full flow? The realization, as Steve said, that we have misplaced a comma, never mind the use of an Oxford comma, whatever that is, and the gleeful expression she would have as she explained the correct use and positioning. Do you know how many commas there are in a book? I can tell you, 7,523 in my book, so 7,500 opportunities for revenge. So it was that I sent her the first couple of chapters, highly nervous and anxious as to what she might say. I was actually quite shocked that she liked the story. She liked the idea and the plot line, even though when the pages were returned, there was more red ink on them than my original black. What she was doing was teaching me how to write, how to write in good English. Much as I had taught her how to swim in Germany, but without the need of a pool or a life jacket. That was Katrina, always teaching, always trying to help. Uniquely gifted, hugely intelligent, with a passion for reading and a passion for language used correctly. She was quick-witted and incredibly funny, but above all, very caring and kind. She's sorely missed. The message, Katrina, is this. In the next few weeks, the book will be published. It will be dedicated to you. And most of the commas will be in the right place. Thank you. Well, I mean, how do you manage to follow uh, your brother and your brother-in-law, you know, in the same breath? Not easy. But, you see, we've heard everything um, they've said, and every word that they've said about Katrina is true. But yet, I could spend a long time uh, speaking to you about different aspects of Katrina and different experiences that I've had. But uh, I'll try and keep myself under control. <laughs> so, yes, I'm really here not to give a tribute as uh, the, my predecessors on the podium uh, have done so well. Uh, I'm really here to wrap up uh, the story um, for those of you who may not have picked it up from other sources, of how we managed to move from a, a beautiful environment uh, like uh, Camberley to a dim and distant northern climate in Scotland. Because, you know, we had been here for, what was it, 37 or, uh, 37 seems to come l large in this uh, family in terms of number, 37 odd, odd years. So that was uh, uh, quite a chunk of our life. and. I look around the room here and I see so many people um, that had a big part to play uh, in that and that uh, 
gave us all a tremendous time whilst we lived here. And we, uh, I'd like to just take a, an opportunity while you're all together to say thank you for that, because um, otherwise what came after wouldn't have been possible. But what came after was a good answer to many questions. So when Anne and I thought the terrible thought of leaving Camberley after all those years and maybe retiring to another spot, we looked long and hard uh, at uh, various different places and we picked this wild place up in Scotland because it is a, it's a remarkable place. And I encourage all of you to come and visit us up there sometime. Uh, you, you, you'll see immediately why we did what we did. But there were other reasons. Uh, we did have family in the area, uh, both uh, uh, Anne's family and my own. Um, and, well, we, we, we had good reasons to go and uh, live close by uh, uh, those families. So uh, that was one thing. Um, the other thing was, it's a very healthy place. Now, Katrina, at this time, was going through one of the downs, perhaps, in uh, a life of up and downs. All our lives are up and downs, really. And so, I think she'd, uh, uh, she'd broken up uh, in a, uh, a long-term uh, relationship. Uh, she'd um, managed to work her way out of a job uh, and she'd um, uh, uh, basically, um, well, her flat, which was a lovely flat in Farnborough, um, depended really on the, the goodness of the, uh, the tenants that she managed to come, uh, get to come and share with her, her flat because if you get a, a great tenant, that's fine. If you get a poor tenant, then that life becomes miserable. So her longtime uh, friend and, uh, uh, and tenant, uh, Malini Das, um, left uh, to return to India, as uh, uh, sometimes happens. And uh, so she was without really company. And I can tell you, company is the sort of the most important uh, uh, aspect of all those things. So. Yeah, uh, we'd say we, she was pretty down and she got a little bit depressed, or quite, quite a lot depressed really uh, at the time. So we said, well, Katrina, we're thinking of, um, uh, of making this big move to Scotland. Um, would you like to come with? Now, I'd, I'd asked her that question once before uh, when we went to work in South Africa uh, for a while. And she said to my shock and horror at the time, no, <laughs> I don't want to go with you. I said, no, no, it's a great place. You have a good time there. And uh, you'll get a, uh, you know, a new experience. Eventually, she joined us in South Africa, but she decided to stay to complete her A-levels uh, in this country. So she said no, and it was her decision. Uh, I left it up to her entirely. Um, so I said, asked her the same question again in the full expectation that she would, she would say no. Quite the reverse. Took her about 10 seconds of consideration and she said, no, that, 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 I'll do that. So sure enough, um, uh, she did move up to Scotland with us or a couple of months after we, um, we, we ourselves went up there. And um, she wanted to stay to see her friend Malini Das uh, uh, back off to uh, India uh, safely uh, and to close up her flat and do what uh, was necessary there. So that was how Katrina decided to come with us up to, uh, up to Scotland. As, as people have eloquently discussed uh, before, uh, or described before, um, she was not above attracting the odd, um, the odd disaster or two. So on the way up to Scotland, uh, we decided she'd travel by train, and um, she got as far as York, <laughs> and, and she collapsed. Um, <laughs> fortunately, the train was uh, uh, well equipped with uh, doctors and student doctors who had a good look at her and uh, found that um, she really needed to be removed from the train 
and taken to uh, the nearest hospital and uh, treated for whatever was ailing with her because they certainly couldn't work it out. So uh, that indeed happened. So we got a telephone call and um, we went down to York. It's a lovely city, I might add. And, um, and we fetched her up and so she completed the journey uh, with us and that was fine. But when she got to Scotland, she realized the true enormity of what we had asked of her. Because we live miles, we really seriously do live miles from anywhere. And if you're a 30-something you know, uh, young lady, uh, you don't want to go and sort of spend most of your time communing with, uh, with sheep and uh, the odd uh, uh, passing bus driver. But um, I think one of the things that, that comes through from Katrina's difficulties uh, uh, right the way up to her last days was that uh, she could be very stoical, and she could definitely um, build uh, a life for herself, irrespective of the circumstances with which she had to deal. So uh, she set to work, did she not? And, and she, uh, um, of course, we knew by that time that she had a taxier. But funnily enough, there's, there's an upside to having a taxier very faint upside by comparison to the downside, but you can get yourself a pass. And the one link with civilization that we have up in Strathtumble is a bus. And it comes by, I don't know, how about, about three, three, two buses a day. Um, and so she found that with the ataxia comes a free bus pass. And, uh, and, and it's an amazing in Scotland, let me tell you. You can, you can travel from top to toe of Scotland on this free bus pass, irrespective of, the, of, of uh, you know, how many miles it is or, or what the cost is. So she, set, no, she got this bus pass and she then started to travel around. She found an, an ataxia soci uh, society in a uh, close by town, 15 to 20 miles away. Um, and uh, went and joined them and, uh, and did uh, a lot of uh, work. They did, they did their own fundraising and uh, basically uh, had a good knees up from time to time. And that was uh, uh, very good for people who have a tax here because it's, uh, it's a serious business. Anyhow, she, she did all that and then uh, she took on a, a sort of a, a cataloging task, which was to find all the coffee shops and restaurants and all those emporia around Pitlochry, of which there are quite a few, let me tell you, because it's a tourist town par excellence, um, and become, she became known in all of them, every single one of them, um, uh, and uh, this, this was fine. Uh, and then, having established a quite reasonable life of leisure for herself, she made a lot of friends on the bus and, uh, and, and in those cafes and so on and so forth. She walked into Fisher's Hotel, which is the biggest, if not the smartest hotel in, in Pitlochry, and, um, uh, and demanded a job. Uh, she'd done this before, and every time she'd done it before, she succeeded. I mean, if only I had that trick in my career, God, I'd, I would have done so much better. Anyhow, she, she worked it, and uh, as you've heard uh, probably uh, from uh, my lady wife, if you have conversations with her, they eventually contacted her and asked her to uh, come back and take up her post. Now, I know that one or two of the people that are here today know that, uh, a little bit about the, uh, um, the, the job of a hotel receptionist. Yeah, maybe, a little bit. But um, let me tell you, it is one heck of a job. It is one of the highest stress, it's one of the, um, the most um, unthanked jobs that, that, that you could ever come across. Because what you do is you, 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 you face a series of tired and angry people who come through the door off coaches and trains and buses and planes, and you have to make them welcome somehow. And, and most of the time, they're not ready, ready for that. And then when they've been upstairs and become disappointed with their rooms and found the, uh, the, the rats in the, underneath the bath and all the rest of that sort of stuff, you have to accept the complaints because you are the front face of the, uh, on, on, the, on the desk downstairs. And down they come. And you know that they never saw a rat under the bath. Because um, it's the, the best way in Fisher's Hotel, let me tell you, 
and it, this is for free. It is the best way of getting a free bottle of Prosecco <laughs> because that's the, that's the best way that they have of dealing with the, uh, um, uh, of dealing with the level of complaints that they have in Fisher's Hotel, which are many. Anyway, Fisher's Hotel is my, now my favorite hotel in Pitlochry because not only did they give Katrina a job and a challenge which actually suited her character and lifestyle extremely well, but when we got into difficulties and finally poor Katrina died, they, well, they treated us like family and they took on the organization of, uh, of uh, the uh, what I would call the wake and so on and so forth and we just didn't have to worry about any part of that and um, let me tell you that the people who are in Pitlochry are all a little bit of that ilk because when you get in trouble boy do they they, they rally round and help you so we, we had a lot of that and we're very grateful for it um, and so that Fisher's Hotel I can, it's only got three stars but I can recommend it to, uh, to all of you and, uh, and I know James Craig uh, told you that, uh, that he was there, and he can vouch for all I'm saying. Anyhow, um, I didn't mean to keep you uh, uh, quite, uh, quite this long with stories like that. Uh, what I was really here to do was to uh, sort of um, tie up the, the detail, I suppose, of, uh, of uh, Katrina's last few months. I and um, this might be a bit tricky because I haven't worn this suit for quite well. Ah, look at that. A few notes to help me along. Yeah. Mm. So I'll jump to the end of all these notes. It's quite uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the only thing to do in the circumstances. Um, yeah. Katrina was fine up, um, up until uh, probably about six months uh, before she finally died. And um, she'd... Um, come to terms, as uh, Steve said, with the ataxia uh, and uh, learned how to deal with that and the, uh, the pressure job that she had. Um, then, in August of, um, of 21, we found a, uh, she had a small ulcer in her mouth. Nothing need to worry about. I get ulcers all the time. I don't know about you, but uh, uh, that, that was um, something that wouldn't go away. So then... Um, uh, she complained about this uh, to the local pharmacist because getting it, getting it proper medical attention uh, in uh, Pitlochry is the same as, uh, as it's been more or less around the whole country now. Uh, difficult. But you can go to the pharmacist and they're pretty darn good normally. And uh, they, um, the pharmacist had one, uh, one look at uh, Katrina's uh, um, thing, uh, her ulcer, and sent her off to the dentist. The dentist had one look and sent her off to the cancer specialist at uh, uh, Dundee, um, where uh, Ninewells Hospital, a very fine place indeed. Yeah, uh, they decided very quickly on surgery uh, as the answer. Um, so nine hours surgery ensued, um, in which quite a lot of um, uh, poor old Katrina's um, um, teeth were removed. and. Uh, as far as we knew, all the cancer. So we're in a place where we have to recover a little bit from uh, that kind of uh, experience before they can rebuild the teeth. So Katrina was gung-ho and, re and ready for that. And we got an all clear, as I think somebody else mentioned uh, uh, at Christmas time, uh, that uh, we could, we could that, that, uh, get, that, get on with that particular task in the new year. Sadly, uh, the new year came, and along with the new year came a, a bit of a swelling uh, uh, around the, the mouth, and uh, I think Katrina herself knew before we knew that, that was the cancer returning. Um, the second bout of cancer moved very, very swiftly, and, um, you know, they tried uh, chemotherapy, and they had lined up all sorts of other therapies, um, but this thing moved too fast, uh, and so poor old Trina died on the 25th of March, and that was the end of that story, um, and it's a bit harrowing, and I've put you through it, and I, I do apologize. <laughs> um, but 
It left me, like, like it left uh, Stephen, it left me with a, a, an, abiding, uh, an abiding memory or, or, or opinion of Katrina that I didn't have beforehand. And that was that um, she really did have an ability to take a tough situation and make good out of it. So throughout all of that, all of those experiences, her attitude was just amazing. Did she get depressed like she used to back in the flat when she lost a, a friend or a, or a job? Not at all. She undertook other, other projects and, uh, uh, and um, she, um, she never made it apparent how she really, really felt. Somebody said uh, that Katrina had um, many masks or many, many ways of masking it. I think it was James. And, um, she had another one for this. So she made our job in all this very, very easy. So, yeah, I think, I, I think that if you had that talent, I mean, what a talent we, uh, we all could, uh, we, we could make, what a use we could all make of that talent uh, if we could use it in our day-to-day -day lives. Not worry too much about adversity, but find some, uh, something positive and make something good out of it. So she did, and um, God bless her for it, and God bless you all for coming here, because this is probably the biggest gathering of friends and family uh, who knew Katrina and, uh, and Anne and I that I have seen since, I don't know, um, uh, since ever. And uh, I do thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming here and listening to the story, uh, which is uh, now uh, I'm finished with, at any rate. So, well, what we'll just do now uh, is I think we'll get the, uh, uh, the uh, other members of the family up here and uh, just share a, a prayer or two that um, have been written uh, for this occasion and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll move on to, uh, uh, to Father John who will help us out uh, with the wind-up. So thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Anne and Alan have been, I know it's a, a phrase used a lot, blessed, truly blessed, but they are truly blessed with the most wonderful neighbours in Scotland. And one of them, a man whom some of you may remember called Julian de Havilland, wrote this short poem for Katrina and for Anne and Alan. And the title is in Latin and my Latin is limited to singing Latin hymns. It's Tantus Dolor Non Sit Casus, which I think translates as so great pain is not in vain. This tragic death, let's not pretend even the closest, wisest friend can find no word of comfort here. Nothing to give, nothing to share. Who else can comprehend such loss but Mary weeping at the cross? God's will as ever hard to know, but this, that we must let her go. Who gives in love then takes away to dwell with him in endless day, where your endearing, suffering love is known and blessed in heaven above. Her soul secure in peace we know, now can her treasured ashes go where, by the fairest cape of all, tears of sweet memory will fall. And where beneath the southern sky, love and good hope will never die. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together today to share our memories of Katrina, of Kat. With thanksgiving for her life, Katrina, daughter, sister, cousin, and friend will always be in our hearts.
Thank you, Lord, for Katrina's love of language. We ask you to bless all writers, editors, journalists, teachers, and wordsmiths. Thank you, Lord, for Katrina's love of music. We ask you to bless all musicians and singers. Thank you, Lord, for Katrina's concern for others and for a just world. We ask you to bless all who work for a better world. Thank you, Lord, for all doctors, nurses, and other health workers who care for those who are ill, especially all those who cared for Katrina at Nine Wells Hospital, Dundee, and at the Athol Medical Center, Pitlochry. We ask you to bless them. Thank you, Lord, for the nurses and all at Macmillan Cancer Care for their care of Kat Katrina. We ask you to bless them. Thank you, Lord, for the joy Katrina brought in all our lives. We ask you to bless us. We ask this, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's now pray in the words of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen.
My very grateful thanks to Katrina. Look at what she has done today, gather you all together. And uh, the story doesn't end there. We give thanks for her life. A life, as I say, which now will have the fullness of all that life can bring, promised by the Lord himself. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, that we may too share in the fullness of that life. On behalf of Helen and, and James, may I say thanks to Sarah, Simon, Mary uh, for their assistance in this and to all who spoke and played and sang so beautifully. So let us now go and share food, hospitality and friendship again. The Lord be with you all. May Almighty God bless you, watch over you and keep you safe from all harm, guide you and give you a good life. And may you follow in the footsteps of those you admire, love and value. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Troubled 